there's a lot of emerging science on a new training intervention that's having alarming impacts on aerobic performance. And the craziest part, you don't even have to pedal hard. It's called blood flow restriction training. And here at Trainer Road, we dug into the science so you don't have to. Blood flow restriction training, or BFR training for short, uses an elastic band or an inflatable cuff to restrict blood flow while you train. For cyclists, you'd wanna put this on your leg and proximal on the limb, or as high up toward that hip joint as possible. What this does is mostly restrict the blood flow from going into the limb and almost entirely restrict the blood flow from going out of that limb. And the theory here is that blood flow restriction training just exacerbates what exercise already does. As intensity increases in normal exercise, our body has to increase the rate at which it pumps blood to, through, and out of our muscles. The reason for this is to deliver more fuel to our muscles and remove metabolic byproducts like lactate so our muscles can operate more effectively. Oh, it's a deep burn! Now, when intensity increases to the point where our body can't satisfy the demand, that's when our muscles enter a state that scientists call muscle toxicity. Muscle toxicity is uncomfortable, but it's also a goal of training. And the more that we experience, the harder our bodies work against that happening in the future. And they do this by building more efficient and stronger muscles. Connecting this back to BFR training, restricting blood flow while exercising induces muscle toxicity at a lower intensity than we would typically experience without BFR training. And this leads to aerobic adaptations. There are additional cardiovascular and general benefits from this, but the point is it makes aerobic adaptations happen. And that's the very thing that all of us cyclists work so hard for day in and day out. So how much improvement to aerobic performance are we talking about here with BFR training? Well, more than you'd think, or at least more than I thought. Let's look at some science. A 2018 systematic review looked at 14 studies on young athletes. 11 of those studies focused on aerobic exercise, while six of them focused specifically on cycling. Of the 11 aerobically focused studies, eight of them saw improvements in VO2 max of the subjects in the studies. And perhaps more importantly for us cyclists, all 11 of those studies saw improvements in mechanisms that lead to aerobic performance. Another set of studies from 2016 and 2017 used cyclists with VO2 max values higher than 60, so pretty fit cyclists. And here's what they did. They gave them four weeks of sprint intensity interval training where they performed 30 second sprints separated by four and a half minutes of recovery, during which they'd apply the BFR cuff to the legs for the first two minutes of rest and then remove it for the last two minutes of rest. So what did they see? They saw VO2 max increases between five and 6% and maximum aerobic power increases between three and 4%. Another study looked at young elite rowers and had them do three sessions per week of two by 10 minutes at low intensity for five weeks. And they saw remarkable improvements in VO2 max as much as 9%. Now it's important to note that most of this research is pretty recent. And relatively speaking, there's a small amount of research published on BFR training as of recording this video. But still, seeing results like this is promising at the very least. And if you're anything like me, it's downright exciting. There's more research going on right now that will surely teach us more about this, the benefits as well as the risks. Speaking of risks, what are they? One review looked at 35 different studies with physical therapy patients and found no detrimental outcomes, but it's not without its potential downsides. First, it's not a recuperative thing to do. Even at low intensity exercise, it was noted in some studies that RPE, or rate of perceived exertion and discomfort was increasing similar to levels that people would experience during high intensity interval training. It also elevates heart rate, increases oxygen uptake, and in one study showed a significant increase in DOMS or delayed onset muscle soreness for 48 hours after. While all these risks may seem manageable, complete arterial occlusion just comes with its own inherent set of risks. So if you've ever had something like a history of heart disease, thrombosis, a currently infected limb, or if you're going through cancer, this is definitely one of those times where you want to talk to your doctor before trying. Assuming you are okay with the risks of BFR training and you're a healthy candidate for it, I'm sure the next question is, how do I implement this into my training plan? And that's where things get a little bit complicated. In the studies we already mentioned, BFR training was implemented in different ways and different outcomes occurred. And according to a 2019 blood flow restriction review, if you change any of the following variables, different outcomes should be expected. The pressure, width, and positioning of the cuff device, exercise duration and intensity, time between intervals, proximity and order of BFR training to standard interval training, frequency and periodization of BFR training. So understanding that changing any of those variables could yield a change in outcome, let's just look at how BFR training was typically implemented in the studies we've looked at so far. The goal is to achieve roughly 40 to 80% of arterial occlusion and then go through a specific training protocol. 
In some studies, they had athletes use it only during the recovery intervals of their high intensity interval workouts. Whereas in other studies, they had them perform specific low intensity work with a BFR cuff applied. Regardless of how it was implemented, in every study, the goal wasn't to spend a lot of time in a BFR state. Instead, it was to spend just enough time so that you were getting the benefits of BFR training without harming recovery or your future workouts. This typically varied between 15 to 30 minutes of total time accumulated in a 24 hour period, and is often split up into multiple shorter sessions. With those basics out of the way, the next logical question is, should this serve as a replacement for your scheduled workouts? But as of now, BFR doesn't look like it's a replacement for interval training. And here's why. Let's look at the science. In the study with cyclists that saw increases in max aerobic power between three to 4%, the researchers made a really crucial note. They said, more work is required to translate laboratory findings to real world applications. And in another study, researchers saw increases in hypertrophy and myonuclear addition, but no increases in strength. So let's recap. What has the current research told us and not told us about BFR training for cyclists? As of now, research points to convincing improvements in mechanisms that drive aerobic performance, but we have yet to link BFR training to becoming a faster cyclist. Number two, it also seems like it's a good supplementary addition to your training, but not a replacement for the training itself. Third, we know it needs to be executed carefully to get specific outcomes, but we still don't know which cycling disciplines benefit most or least from this sort of training intervention, or how you should go about it specifically for your cycling discipline. Finally, it seemed low risk, but we still don't know if any long-term risks exist with BFR training. It's important to keep all of this in perspective and respect the research for what it is and is not saying. Although it seems very promising that BFR training could improve performance on the bike, it is yet to be conclusively proven by science. Structured interval training for cyclists, however, has an ever-growing mountain of evidence showing that it does make cyclists faster. So if you have to choose, absolutely pick your structured workouts and stick to that training plan. In conclusion, as of now, it seems reasonable to use BFR training as you would any other additive training intervention, like heat training or elevation training. If you're a good candidate for it, you're okay with the risks, it seems reasonable to implement it into your training as long as it doesn't compromise the workouts or recovery that you have going on during your training plan. As for me, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna keep prioritizing consistency and following my trainer road training plan, hitting my workouts, and I'll find ways to work in BFR training and experiment with it so long as it's not compromising future workouts or recovery. So that's it for this week. Between now and next time, go down into the comments and let us know what other topics you want us to cover. Like this video if you found it useful, subscribe to our YouTube channel and join us every Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific here on YouTube for the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast and go to trainerroad.com, sign up and become a faster cyclist. Talk to you soon.